Hi everyone. So this is our third video on the topic of my hill neurode theorem. And in this uh, video, we are going to actually prove the my hill neurode theorem. Uh, so in order to prove this theorem, I'll first define an equivalence relation in the context of any language L. So the language L is not necessarily a regular language, but an arbitrary language L. And in context of this, we can define an equivalence relation, which we denote by R sub L, uh, which is defined as follows. So two strings X and Y are said to be in RL if doesn't matter what string Z you choose, if you append Z to both X and Y, then either both X, Z and Y, Z are in L or neither X, Z nor Y, Z is in L. So means maybe it is the case that suppose you choose Z equals zero, then you can say that either both X, zero, Y, zero are in L or neither X, zero, Y, zero, neither X, zero nor Y, zero have an L. Okay. Similarly, maybe if you choose, for example, you can also choose Z to be the empty string. And then you get that if X comma Y is in RL, then either both X and Y have an L or both X and Y, X and Y are not in L. Okay. So in some sense, with respect to the set L, doesn't matter what string Z you choose to append, the membership of XZ and YZ in L have the same value. Either the both of them are there, or both of them aren't there. Okay, so this is the definition of the equivalence relation uh, RL. So let's verify that this is indeed an equivalence relation. So the reflexivity is trivial to see, right? X comma X is always in RL because for if I just substitute Y equals X, then trivially for every Z in sigma star either both XZ and XZ are in L or both XZ and XZ are not in L. Of course, either XZ is in L or XZ is not in L. So uh, that trivially implies the reflexivity property. The symmetry property is also trivial because again, if you look at the definition of the relation RL, the, the definition is symmetric with respect to X and Y. So the odd, precise order of X and Y is immaterial. And finally, the transitivity is again very easy to check. So suppose you know that XY is in RL and YW is in RL, then we seek to prove that X comma W is also in RL. But to see this, suppose we, the, if X and Y are in RL, then it means that for every string Z in sigma star, again, either both XZ, YZ is in L or neither XZ nor YZ in L, YZ is in L. Similarly, because Y, uh, so, so again, let me just repeat this. So if X, Y is in RL, then it means that either both X, Z is in L, Y, Z are in L, or neither X, Z nor Y, Z are in L. And similarly, if X, Y, W is in RL, then it means that either both Y, Z and W, Z are in L, or neither Y, Z nor W, Z are in L. Okay. But together from these two conditions, one, two, and these two next one, two items, you can derive that either both XZ comma WZ, they are both of them are in L, or neither XZ nor WZ are in L, okay? This, by the way, is just the definition of X comma W being in R sub L. And thus you get that, oops, sorry, does you get that if x y is in R L and y as uh, does you get that if x y is in R L and y w is in R L, then you get that x w is also in R L, thus proving the transitivity property. So for any language, and this did not require this definition. Notice that this our proof did not require L to be a regular language. This can be any language L over any alphabet sigma. Okay. So this is a general definition. Now, uh, I, I will, we, will use, we will not directly use this definition right now, but let me just make one definition uh, since given we have defined R sub L. It is that if you choose any language L over sigma with respect to this language L, 
we say two strings x and y are distinguishable if x comma y is not in RL. So what this means is that if, if we say two strings x and y are distinguishable, then it means that there exists some z such that xz is in L and yz is not in L or xz is not in L and yz is in L. So this is equivalent to saying that x and y are distinguishable. So let's just remember this definition. Okay. So, so far we were talking about arbitrary languages L. Now we will think about regular languages, but before we do that, let's define another, yet another equivalence relation. Now, not with respect to a language L, but a DFA M. So let M equals Q sigma delta Q naught F be a DFA. Then with respect to this DFA M, we define an equivalence relation R sub M, again on the set of strings over sigma. Okay, so similar to like, just like RL was an equivalence relation over strings over sigma, so the underlying alphabet sigma. Again here, the relation R sub M is also over strings uh, over sigma. The equivalence relation is defined as follows. X comma Y is in R M, R sub M, if the state reached by M, when you start at the state Q naught and on input X is same as the state reached by M when you start at the initial state Q naught and reach and read the input Y. So in other words, X and Y belong to the relation R sub M if the automata starting from its initial state on reading X and on reading Y reaches the same state. Okay. Again, so this is the definition of the equivalence relation. And again, let us verify that the, this is the relation we defined just now is an equivalence relation. And it is easy to check all the three properties of equivalence relations. The first property is reflexivity is again trivial because X comma X is an RM. Why? Because you just require that the st state reached by the automata M on input X is same as the state reached by automata M on input X because Y is now X. And that is trivially true. That is tautologically true. So reflexivity is trivial to verify. Symmetry again is trivial to verify because our definition of the relation R sub M is symmetric with respect to the strings X and Y. We are not, the definition itself is symmetric with respect to X and Y. And transitivity is again the same because if you know that X comma Y is in RM, if you know that X comma Y is in RM, let's say, and Y comma Z is in RM, then you know that the automata M on reading the input X and reading the input Y takes you to the same state. But you know that automata M on reading input Y and reading input Z also takes you to the same state, which means that the states reached by M on input X and input Z is the same, which thereby implying that the uh, pair X comma Z is an RM, okay? Thus, the relation RM also satisfies transitivity, proving that RM is an equivalence relation. Okay. Now, one thing about relation RM is that the number of classes, equivalence classes given by the equivalence relation RM is at most the number of states in M. In other words, if M is a finite automata, then the number of equivalence classes induced by R sub M is finite. It's some fixed number. And let's just observe that this is true. This is because when you're defining an equivalence relation, uh, when you're defining the equivalence relation RM, then two strings belong to the same equivalence, two, two strings belong to the same equivalence class, provided the automata M takes them to the same state. And thus the equivalence classes can be indexed by the states of the DFA. But the DFA has only a size of 
the DFA has only size of Q many, capital Q many states. And does the number of equivalence relations, uh, does the number of equivalence classes, I'm sorry, in R sub M is at most the number of equivalence, uh, is at most the uh, number of uh, states in the DFA M. Uh, the reason I keep saying at most is because observe that there might be uh, there might be strings, uh, there might be states rather in the DFA, which are not uh, reachable, which are not reachable in the sense that there is no string which takes you, which takes, which starts from the initial state and takes you to that state. So that is why I keep saying at most, but if all states are reachable from the initial state, then the number of equivalence classes induced by RM is precisely the number of states in M. Okay. But the high level pick thing you need to remember is that the equivalence relation RM always has finite number of equivalence classes. So now, so far we have seen two equivalence relation R sub M and R sub L. R sub M is defined with respect to any finite automata M and R sub L is defined with respect to any language L. The next thing we prove is that if M is a DFA and L is the language of that DFA, then R sub M, the equivalence relation R sub M, refines the equivalence relation R sub L. Okay. How do we prove this? So suppose we start, so to prove that this is a refinement, R sub N refines R sub L, you have to show that if X, Y belongs to R M, then X comma Y also belongs to R M. Well, what is the definition of X comma Y belonging to R M? That means that the DFA M on input X reaches the same state as did the, the DFA M does on input Y. But given the input DFA M has reached the same state called, let's say Q on reading inputs X and Y. That means that if the DFA M reaches, reads the input X Z, it will also, it will reach the same state as it does on reading the input Y Z, right? Again, let's see. So suppose like, you know, there's a state Q not, you reach, read X and you read, reach the state Q. And similarly, you read Y, this is, may not be visible very well. So let me redraw this again. Q not Q. So if you read the input X, the DFA reaches Q. And you read the input Y and you reach the same state Q. That is the definition of X and Y belonging to RM. But that means if you read the input X, Z, how then what what is the state that Q, uh, that the DFA will reach? Well, first it will read Q start from Q naught, read input X, reach Q, and then read string Z and reach potentially some other state P. But then observe that if you if the DFA M reads the input Y Z, then again it will first read Y, go to state Q, then read Z and go to state P, which implies that X Z on reading input X Z and reading input Y Z, you reach the same state, which means either both X Z and Y Z are accepted by the DFA, or neither X Z nor Y Z is accepted by the DFA M. This implies that X comma Y is an R L. Okay, and thus if X comma Y is an R M, it is also an R L, showing that the equivalence relation R M refines the equivalence relation RL. An immediate corollary is that since the equivalence relation RM refines the equivalence relation R sub L, where L is, remember, the language of the DFA M, the language of the DFA M, that means that if L is a regular language, then RL has finite number of equivalence classes. That is because 
the relation RM has finite number of equivalence classes. RM refines RL. Thus, RL will also have finite number of equivalence classes. So you get that if L is a regular language, RL must have finite number of equivalence classes. Turns out the converse is also true. Namely, the converse is that if RL has finite number of equivalence classes, if there's any language L such that RL has finite number of equivalence classes, then L is a regular language. So the does so we'll prove this converse now, but does does we get that if L is a regular language, then R sub L has finite number of equivalence classes and vice versa. This is referred to as the myhill nerode theorem. And if you think about it, this is providing a complete characterization of regular languages. It just says L is a regular language if, if R sub L has finite number of equivalence classes. Observe that R sub L, the definition of R sub L, doesn't require any reference to an underlying automata. So potentially one could have imagined that, you know, I could have, without defining automata, I could have just defined regular languages as the lang class of languages L, where R sub L has finite number of equivalence classes without ever referencing automata. Turns out the automata definition, which is more like an operational definition, is equivalent to the syntactic definition, okay? It's a beautiful characterization and just, I, I mean, let me just mention that such characterizations are not known for larger classes of languages. And indeed this, indeed in some sense, uh, the myhill nerode theorem uh, tells you both the power and the weakness of regular languages in one go. Anyway, let's prove the converse. So the converse is that if Avel has finite number of equivalence classes, then L is a regular language. So thus we want to show that if RL has finite number of equivalence classes, then L can be recognized by a finite automata. Okay. So in some sense, the proof of the converse essentially proceeds in the only way you can proceed, okay? So I want to show that L is a regular language. I want to construct a finite automata for L. And the only information I have is that RL has finite number of equivalence classes. So it seems like a natural choice that since RL has finite number of equivalence classes, I should somehow construct a state corresponding to each equivalence class. So that's what we do. So for each equivalence class of R sub L, let me denote it, let me denote this by X sub L. So the string X belongs to the equivalence class X bracket sub L, okay? We add a state in the DFA, okay? So for each string X, we look at the equivalence class and for each such equivalence class X sub L, we add a fine state. Of course, the same equivalence class can have many names, right? If X and Y belong to RL, then X sub L is an alternate name for Y sub L. So I'm saying that if X, Y belong to RL, uh, then X sub L and Y sub L are the same equivalence classes. And so I am not going to create different states for X and Y. I'm just going to create one state per equivalence class. Now, since RL has finite number of equivalence classes, then the number of states I have created is finite. Having defined the states, let's next define what are the final or the accepting states of the DFA. The final or the accepting states of the DFA are just going to be X sub L for those Xs which are in the language. So I start with a bunch of equivalents. I start with a bunch of state, create a bunch of states, and then every state which corresponds to a string, which every state which can be written as X sub L, where uh, X belongs to the language, is included as a final of an accepting state.
the initial state is just the equivalence class of the empty string. Okay. And uh, finally, the we have to define the alphabet is well defined as just sigma. So finally, we have to define the transition function. And the transition function is just defined to be that if you're in the equivalent star uh, state, uh, uh, if you're in the state corresponding to the equivalence class X sub L, then on reading sigma, let me actually give it, on reading sigma, you go to the equivalence class corresponding to the string X sigma. Okay. This is the construction of the DFA. But just because we have defined it like this, we have to make sure that the construction is well defined. In particular, the well definition would mean that uh, the well defined property would mean that if two equivalence classes are the same, namely if x sub l equals y sub l, okay, then we have to make sure that under the transition function delta, which on reading sigma takes the equivalence class of x, so x sub l to x sigma sub l, it should be the case for this def definition to be uh, well formed that the equivalence, if the equivalence class of x and y are identical, then the equivalence class of x sigma and y sigma should also be identical. Okay. Otherwise, the definition, otherwise, it's not a well defined property. Delta is not well defined because I, if x sub l and y sub l are the same, then that means I can call the state x sub l or I can also call the state y sub l. But then under the transition function reading sigma you should go to the same state. That means x sigma sub l should be equal to y sigma sub l. So we should make sure that this is true. Otherwise our definition is, doesn't make sense. So let us verify this. And this is actually quite easy to verify. If x sub l equals y sub l, then it's equivalent to saying that x comma y belongs to RL. This means that I can take any string z and if I append the string sigma z to x and sigma z to y, they should both be in L or they should both not be in L. So I'm appending the string sigma z to both of them. But I can read the string x sigma z as appending z to the strings x sigma and y sigma. And thus I have the property that if I append z, to x sigma and y sigma, either they're both in L or neither is, which is equivalent to saying that x sigma comma y sigma is in R sub L and thus showing that the equivalence class of x sigma and y sigma with respect to L is the same. And thus our definition, the thing we needed to confirm is true. And thus our definition of the automata this definition of the automata, it's well-defined, okay? This is a well-defined, uh, this is a well-defined automata. So having given that we've defined the automata, now let's verify that the language of this automata is indeed L. And uh, this is again easy to verify. It's basically a simple induction. So to verify that L equals L of the automata we constructed, call it M. Observe that if I start at the equivalence class X, delta X, read some of the symbol sigma, I go to the state corresponding to the equivalence class X sigma sub L. Now, suppose our input string X equals X1, X2, Xn. The initial state the automata is in corresponds to the equivalence class epsilon sub L. After reading X1, by definition, we will go to the equivalence class X1 sub L. We'll go to the state corresponding to the equivalence class X1 sub L. After reading X1, X2, well, I'm in state X1 sub L. I read the next symbol X2. I go to the state X1, X2 sub L and so on. So inductively, after reading X1, X2, Xn, the automata is in the state X1, X2, Xn sub L. Okay. And Recall F consists of Y sub L where Y belongs to L. So if X1, X2, Xn, uh, actually, let me just, sorry, 
uh, actually this, uh, let me explain this in a little more detail. So we, so after reading X1, X2, Xn, the automata is in the state X1, X2, Xn sub L, okay? And uh, let me actually just uh, do this part in a little more detail. Sorry about that. So the automata is in the state X1, X2, Xn sub L. And we recall the set of accepting states is y l where y belongs to l okay so now we want to show that the string x1 x2 xn is accepted by this automata if and only if the automata if and only if x1 x2 xn belongs to the language so one direction is trivial right if x1 x2 xn belongs to l then clearly the state x1 x2 xn l belongs to f that is by definition of f and thus x1 x2 xn is accepted by the automata in the other direction in the in the other direction suppose X1, suppose you know that X, suppose the string X1, X2, Xn, suppose the string X equals X1, X2, Xn is accepted by M. Suppose this is true. Okay. Then what happens? Well, if it is accepted, that means that X1, X2, Xn L equals YL for some Y in L. Or in other words, this is equal to saying X1, X2, Xn, Y. Let me actually just call it X really. Is an RL, okay? But this means that for all Z, either both XZ y, z, r, and l, or neither is. Instantiating z to the empty string, we get that either both x, y is an l, or neither x nor y is an l. But observe, we already know that y is an l, which implies that x must be an l. So we logically conclude that x must be an l, and thus, if on input x, the automata, the automata we just constructed reaches a fine, reaches a, a, an accepting state of the automata, it must be the case that the string x belongs to the language. And thus the language of this automata is precisely the language L, okay? Which concludes our proof, okay? So let me just recap because this was a lo some long proof. So let me just conclude what we did. Okay, so we were trying to show that if RL has a finite number of equivalence classes, then L is a regular language. And to do this, what we did is, we took the equivalence classes of RL with respect to RL. For each equivalence class X sub L, we constructed a state in the automata. Then we defined a set of final states to be those states which correspond to equivalence classes of accepting strings, and again, like this little argument at the end should tell you that if and if there's one accepting string in an equivalence class, if there's one, this little argument that we showed in the end should tell you that if there's one uh, accepting string in an equivalence class, then all the strings in the equivalence class are, are uh, belong to the language. If there's one string which belongs to the language in an equivalence class, all the strings belong to the language. Anyway, so we defined a set of final states to be the set of those states uh, which, uh, which consists of equivalent, which correspond to equivalence classes consisting of strings in the language. The initial state corresponds to the equivalence class of the empty string. And then we define the transition function 
which takes the equivalence class of x or the state corresponding to the equivalence class of x to the state corresponding to the equivalence class of x sigma on the input sigma. We confirmed that this definition is well meaningful. We made sure that this definition is consistent, it's well defined. And after having done that, we showed that once you've constructed this automata, then starting from the state corresponding to the empty string, which is the initial state, if you read the input x, which you call x1, x2, xn, after it's like I excise the symbol and I it bit, then the equivalence class, then the equivalence class reached by the automata correspond to the, corresponds to the state of the equivalence class of x. Okay. And then we showed that does it means that if a string belongs to the language, it lands up in an accepting state or final state of the DFA. And if X does not belong to the language, then it does not land up in the final state of the DFA, thus concluding the proof. So this finishes the proof of the myhill nerody theorem. A corollary is this. We already know that R, R sub M, if M is a finite automata, if let M be a finite automata, and L be the language of the automata, we have already seen that R sub M refines R sub L. In other words, the number of equivalence classes in R sub M is at least as large as equivalence classes, number of equivalence classes in R sub L. On the other hand, the converse part of the myhill nevada theorem showed that if there is a finite, so, so does, okay, so we get let M be a finite automata and L equals L of M, okay? Let me write the corollary first, then, the smallest uh, then the automata number of states in M is at least as large as RL. Further, there is an automata M prime such that L equals L of M prime and which has precisely number of equivalence classes in RL number of states. Okay. So first part we show in the first part of the myhill nevada theorem, we showed that if M is a finite automata and L is the language corresponding to it, then the number of states in M cannot be fewer than the number of equivalence classes in RL. And the converse part of the theorem showed that in fact this bound is tight in the sense that if L is any regular language, then you can construct an automata which has precisely the number of the precisely as many states as the number of equivalence class in R sub L. So thus the minimum DFA The minimum DFA, that means the DFA, DFA for the regular language L, which has the fewest number of states, has precisely number of equivalence classes in RL number of states. So what this is saying is that if you come up with any regular language, then there is a smallest DFA which computes this language L, which recognizes this regular language L, and the number of equivalence classes in that 
is precisely the number of equivalence classes in R sub L. So in some sense, you can think of if you think of a regular language, a language and the DFA as a program for computing the language and the number of states as a measure of the size of the program, then the myhill nerode theorem tells you that the size of the smallest program computing this regular language L is precisely the number of equivalence classes in RL. Uh, there's such a characterization, while well, this, so this basically is something true for finite automata, but such a characterization is missing, uh, certainly missing, and in, in fact, like you know, we'll see it's probably impossible to obtain really for la richer classes of programs like Turing machines, which you will see later in the course. Okay, so to recap what we saw in this lecture, we started with the definition of RL. Okay, we took a line, we started with the language L and we defined an equivalence relation R sub L on the strings over sigma. This is true, this is well defined by any language and regular or not regular. Then we gave the notion of no definition of distinguishable strings. Then corresponding to finite automata, we defined an equivalence relation R sub M again over in strings over sigma, where sigma is the underlying alphabet. And then we showed two things. We first showed that uh, if L is the language corresponding to LM, it's corresponding to automata M, so L equals LM, then RM refines RL, which means that if L is a regular language, then the consequently you get that RL must have finite number of equivalence classes. And then he showed that if the L is any language which has finite number of, of such that RL has finite number of equivalence classes, then it's a regular language. And for this, we constructed the automata. And thus we arrive at the myhill nerode theorem, which says that a language L is regular if and only if RL has finite number of equivalence classes. And in fact, the number of equivalence classes of RL for a regular language L is precisely also the number the fewest number of states in a DFA computing L or recognizing L. So with that, let me conclude this video.